proper if difficult topic. And uh, this is kind of an overview or an outline of what I'm going to talk about, I'll make some initial comments. Um, then I'm going to talk about the approach to the dizzy patient because um, so many of these patients, their, uh, their initial complaint and sometimes their chief complaint is dizziness. And um, I know that every emergency room physician or mid-level, as soon as they hear that the complaint is dizziness, they groan inwardly and say, oh, not another dizzy patient. And so I think that um, is, I understand, I know there's a lot of dizzy pe people out there, and they don't, obviously most of them don't have strokes, but a significant minority do. And I'm just going to try to make the case that if you just approach the patient clinically, the vast majority of time you can actually make a diagnosis just on clinical grounds. So um, then I'm going to talk about the HINTS data, uh, uh, which HINTS stands for Head Impulse Nystagmus Test. And it's uh, a way of uh, clinically evaluating posterior circulation stroke patients. Then I'm going to go through a little bit of neuro, uh, anatomy. You know, I, as a neurologist, we can't do a talk if we don't have some kind of anatomy in the talk. And then uh, I'm gonna go through five typical posterior circulation stroke syndromes, and then uh, we'll do some cases at the end. It's a lot of stuff, so. So things to think about, first of all, just sort of frame the issue. And this top bullet point is actually from a New England Journal of Medicine article from the mid-1980s, a long time ago, and over 30 years ago. And this article pointed out that, you know, more than, uh, for patients over the age of 60 who come to the emergency room with a sudden onset of dizziness, and 25% of them will have a posterior circulation stroke. Now, that key word is sudden, which I'm gonna make a uh, I'm going to emphasize more later, but that's a really key feature already in the history. If the patient says, I'm sitting on the couch watching television when suddenly I became dizzy, that is, that's, that's a red flag, sudden onset for, for posterior circulation ischemia. And I, I point out that this New England Journal article from the mid-80s was before we had diffusion-weighted imaging. Which, which is our technique now for picking up on acute strokes. So I'm quite, quite certain that if they would have had diffusion imaging back then, that number would be even higher. And I think when I show you the HINTS data, you'll, you'll see what I mean. Your failure to diagnose uh, these events is now the number one cause of successful litigation against primary care physicians as emergency room physicians. Um, so it's, it's a big issue. And why is that the case? Well, because the uh, plaintiff's attorney will say, well, you, my client missed an opportunity to get that clot buster drug because the diagnosis wasn't made. So that's why it is. But I don't think we should, that should be our primary motivating factor. And I think there are other more compelling reasons why it's important to make this diagnosis, and um, and that's for the benefit of the patient, right? I mean, that's that's what we do. What we do, and you know, in giving this talk a number of times, I sometimes get some pushback about, well, aren't these really minor strokes anyway? And what's the big deal? And um, why isn't this just another example? of us all being slaves to guidelines and does it really matter that much whether we make the diagnosis. And of course, I would, I find that, you know, a little bit um, disconcerting in, on the face of it that it doesn't matter whether we diagnose somebody with a stroke or not. But I think there are some good reasons to diagnosis and that's because even though the deficits aren't as dramatic as with, let, let's say, for example, a left middle cerebral artery syndrome where the patient's aphasic with a right hemiplegia, deficits are much milder, they can still be quite disabling for a patient. For example, a patient that has a posterior cerebral artery distribution stroke 
their only deficit is going to be a visual field cut. But that can be a disabling uh, deficit for a patient. They can't drive with a visual field deficit. So how do you get by in our society if you can't drive? And cerebellar ataxia, common posterior circulation symptom. And I, while I would agree that most younger patients with cerebellar infarctions recover pretty well, in an older patient who maybe has some baseline balance difficulties anyway, they get a cerebellar infarct and they're all of a sudden they're wheelchair bound. It's not such a benign thing. Dysphagia, swallowing difficulty. Now, patients with anterior circulation strokes who have hemiparesis usually have some degree of swallowing difficulty initially with their stroke, but typically that gets better for the most part relatively soon. But in the posterior circulation, particularly in the lateral medullary infarction or the Wallenberg, which is the most common brainstem stroke, the nuclei for the posterior oropharynx and the swallowing mechanism are in that part of the brainstem. So if you have an infarction there, the dysphagia is much more severe than it is in anterior circulation events. In fact, just as an illustration, we recently had a, uh, an attorney in his 40s, practicing attorney in his 40s, who had a Wallenberg syndrome due to a vertebral artery dissection, and his only persistent deficit was his trouble swallowing. And in fact, he was discharged from the hospital with a peg tube because he, I mean, he, he had absolutely no sensation of swallowing. Everything that went into his mouth went right into his lungs. I don't know if he's better since then, but it was a very bad deficit for him. Uh, and finally, um, while most patients with posterior circulation uh, ischemia do not require intraarterial thrombectomy, so they're different in that sense than the anterior circulation patients, the one exception to that rule is people with basal artery thrombosis. And that is the one posterior circulation ischemic event that we do typically send patients to IA for. And um, uh, th if those aren't recognized, then they're not treated. So if patients are recognized, they can get, even though their NI stroke scales will be low, because, and that's because when the NI stroke scale was devised, it was weighted toward anterior circulation events. For example, um, if you're uh, aphasic, you can get up to seven points on the scale just for being aphasic. But you get zero points if you're ataxic, either truncal ataxia or gait ataxia, you get zero points. So just by the nature of the way the scale was designed, it doesn't, it de-emphasizes posterior circulation ischemia. So I can tell you that I personally have given TPA a number of times to people with an NIH stroke scale of zero because their symptom was ataxia and um, it was a significant deficit, but it doesn't score on the NIH stroke scale. Those patients are, so if you make the diagnosis and they're within the window, three or 4.5 hour window, you can give them IV thrombolysis. And because the effectiveness of IV throm uh, alteplase is to some extent dependent on the uh, volume or size of the clot, and since most of the clots in these are, put, are smaller, the likelihood of getting benefits is, is higher. Um, and of course, the other reason to diagnose a stroke is that if you have a stroke, even a minor stroke, your risk of having another one is increased, and so we can mitigate that risk by uh, determining the mechanism of your stroke and doing our most intelligent secondary stroke prevention. So these are the reasons why maybe I'm sounding defensive at the beginning, but I think these are the reasons to sort of set the stage why it's important. So how do you make um, diagnosis of posterior circulation ischemia? Well, one takeaway point that I want to make is that the key to the diagnosis is clinical, that I'm convinced that you can make the diagnosis 
clinically. By that I mean based on the history and the examination, more than 90% of the time confidently. And uh, I know we love our imaging. Dr. Bennett just walked back in the room. He loves, his, he loves the imaging. I love imaging. But unfortunately, it doesn't help you a lot of times and most of the time. Non-contrast CT scan in the acute onset is going to be normal almost all the time. Uh, the only thing you're going to see on a CT scan is if there's a hemorrhage. If there's a cerebellar hemorrhage, you'll see it on a CT scan. But if it's an ischemic stroke, CT is not going to help you. CT angiogram, well, if you're an older patient with vascular risk factors and you get a CT angiogram and there's some atherosclerosis in the vertebral, in one of the vertebral arteries, you know, does that mean you're having a stroke? Um, even if one of the vertebral arteries is occluded, does that mean you're having a stroke? Well, not necessarily. Um, and I think I've already mentioned that the clinical presentations are different and the physical findings um, are not as dramatic. And again, whatever the symptoms are, abrupt onset, should at least cross your mind, hmm, that's why we call it stroke. Stroke, abrupt onset. So if something happens abruptly, at least cross your mind, could this be a stroke? Here's the spectrum of, of clinical symptoms of posterior circulation ischemia. And you can see there's a lot of, there are a lot of symptoms. And it's really a broader spectrum of symptomatology than you just normally would see in the anterior circulation, which is part of what makes it difficult to examine these patients. But I put at the top of the list headache and neck pain. So a lot of the time when people come in the emergency room and they're dizzy, and what is this presyncope? Is this a peripheral vestibular problem or, or what? If the patient, when they had sudden onset of their dizziness, if they also complain of headache or neck pain, that should be a red flag. That this is not, patients with inner ear infections typically do not have headache or neck pain. Patients with presyncope typically do not have headache or neck pain. So if somebody has abrupt onset of dizziness and headache or neck pain, that's two red flags already. And you haven't even touched the patient. In the first 10 seconds of the interview, they're dizzy and they have headache and neck pain. So already you have two red flags. Dizziness, I'll expand more about that. Dizziness means different things to different people. It isn't always vertigo. Blurred vision should be, um, patients have difficulty uh, describing their visual complaints. And some patients with homonymous hemianopsia aren't even aware that they have a visual field problem. I had a patient recently who was brought in um, after a motor vehicle accident and she ran into a car she didn't see, was brought in um, for a trauma alert and um, the physician examining her note happened to notice that she had no peripheral vision. Well, she had a posterior circulation stroke lost her peripheral vision to the left, didn't see the other car, ran into it, wasn't even aware that she had a visual field deficit. deficit. And that is not uncommon. Um, other patients, and that's why you always have to examine the visual fields in a dizzy patient. And um, some patients will say they have blurred vision, but they can't really pinpoint what's wrong. So, but the presence of a visual complaint is another thing to think about that raise your level of suspicion. This could be posterior circulation ischemia. Double vision for sure. If the patient says they have double vision, then they have a posterior circulation ischemic event until proven otherwise. And here's the thing that people get confused about. They say, well, a patient says they have double vision, but I did the eye movements and they look normal to me. Well, the visual system is incredibly sensitive and if the patient's ability to move their eyes is off by one or two degrees, 360, one or two degrees, they, have, they see two images. You can't see a ophthalmoparesis, a limitation of 
of eye movement until it's at least 10 or 15 degrees. So there are going to be lots of patients that have double vision that you cannot see in ophthalmoparesis. So don't say the patient's hysterical if you can't, if just because you can't see an ophthalmoparesis. Crossed facial or extremity numbness. So this is, by crossed, I mean face is numb on one side, body is numb on the other. So this is maybe counterintuitive. We're used to everything being on the same side. And that's true in anterior circulation events, but it's not true in posterior circulation events. Typically, numbness or weakness on the face, uh, on one side, the body on the other. So that kind of cross, we call a cross syndrome, also is a, a uh, important symptom complex in posterior circulation ischemia. Bilateral extremity weakness. Now normally somebody comes in and says they're weak all over. You know, normally that's not, certainly not an anterior circulation of, of stroke, but it could be a posterior circulation of stroke because the the, the pyramidal tracts for the extremities come down through the brainstem. So you can be quadriparetic or quadriplegic from a pontine or brainstem stroke. Speech difficulty. Now, speech I divide into language difficulty and a mechanical difficulty of speech. So. People who have slurred speech or what we call dysarthric, they have a problem with the um, motor elements of speech. They're moving their tongue and their posterior oropharynx. Aphasia or dysphasia is a language problem. That's a cognitive problem. That's an inability to either comprehend uh, speech as having meaning or ability to express um, speech uh, ha as having meaning. So you can have either one in posterior circulation ischemia. Most aphasic posterior circulation patients will have what we call a receptive aphasia, meaning that they'll have more trouble comprehending than they will talking. Your typical anterior circulation patient, the expressive aphasia, which we've all seen many times, people have trouble getting their words out, <coughs> Receptive aphasia is the opposite. Those people are, t their receptive aphasia patients are talking, they're making a lot of nonsense, but they have no ability to comprehend um, what's being said to them. So we call it receptive aphasia. Swallowing difficulty, I've already emphasized, is common in posterior circulation. Balance difficulties, uh, ataxia, which can be either truncal ataxia, um, having the patient sit on the edge of the bed without falling over or gait ataxia. And then what I call the three H's of the Wallenberg syndrome. As I mentioned before, the Wallenberg is the most common brainstem stroke. And the three H's are the Horner sign, which is ptosis and meiosis. Ptosis of, of the eyelid, meiosis meaning smaller pupil. So if somebody comes in complaining of dizziness, and has a Horner's, you're done. They have a posterior circulation ischemic event. Hoarseness, as opposed to dysarthria. Okay, dysarthria is slurring of speech. Hoarseness is something we probably have all had when we've had laryngitis or an upper respiratory infection, and that's due to, um, <clears throat> it, it, when you have laryngitis, it's due to inflammation of the vocal cords, when you have a Wallenberg, it's due to the fact that the vocal cord is not working because the um, nu nuclei, the control, the recurrent laryngeal nerve are in the brainstem. So acute onset of hoarseness associated with dizziness is also a, a posterior circulation ischemic event. And then hiccups. Whoever thought of hiccups as being a sign of stroke? But again, the nuclei for hiccups are um, diaphragmatic myoclonus. Is a diaphragm is controlled by the phrenic nerve. Phrenic nerve nuclei are in the brainstem. So if somebody comes in with sudden onset of dizziness and they're having hiccups, they have a posterior circulation ischemic event. Now, whoops. You know, patients are not going to have all of these symptoms. And typically with a posterior circulation event, 
patients have one or two or maybe three symptoms. But the dizzy patient that has double vision, crossed numbness, speech difficulty, swallowing difficulty, balance difficulties, or any of those three H's, that's a stroke. The discussion, I mean, get their non-contrast CT scan and give them TPA. Okay, approach to the dizzy patient. Open-ended history taking, I would argue, is always important, but never more important than in this circumstance. Now, what do I mean by open-ended? I mean that you don't go in to the patient's room and ask the patient a bunch of questions for which the answer is either yes or no. You know, for example, in this particular situation, if the patient says they're dizzy, it's not correct to then say, well, is the room spinning? You know, don't ask the patient that. Let this, ask the patient, tell me what you mean by dizzy. Describe your dizziness. What do you mean dizzy? If the patient says that the room is rotating around, then okay, then they have vertigo. But if they say they're lightheaded or they feel like they're gonna pass out or that they have no balance, then that's a diff totally different thing. When patients say they have no balance, you know, that is a red flag for post circulation <coughs> ischemia. So some patients mean ataxia, no balance. Some people mean presyncope, some mean vertigo. But it's much more powerful if the patient tells you which of these three than if, you, if you're asking. And I would say in terms of history taking, if the patient has had, has vertigo, they tell you they had a previous episode at some point in the past, then that points the needle much more toward it being a peripheral vestibular problem as opposed to a, a stroke, a central problem or stroke. So vertigo is a movement hallucination, um, and it can be either central, meaning brainstem or cerebellum, which usually means stroke, or peripheral, which means the labyrinth, which I'll show you a picture of in a minute. So just vertigo of itself is not distinguishing between central or peripheral. And uh, peripheral vertigo often has hearing loss and tinnitus associated with it. This would be particularly in something like Meniere syndrome, who typically have hearing loss and tinnitus. Central vertigo, which is the things we talked about on the previous slide, double vision, numbness, dysarthria. So anybody that has vertigo with one or more of these symptoms, it's, it's gonna be central. So here's the picture. This is the brainstem, the medulla, the lowest part of the brainstem. These are the vestibular nuclei in the, in the lateral medulla, this is the, you can see the lateral, the lateral, when I say lateral medullary infarction is the Wallenberg, this is where the stroke is. So this is why you get vertigo with lateral medullary syndrome. These are the central nuclei. And then the peripheral, here's the labyrinth, which is where basically a system is designed to tell the, the brain where the head is moving in space. And these are the semicircular canals where um, the calcium oxalate crystals develop that cause the infamous benign positional vertigo, um, so, so uh, which I'll sp speak more about in a minute. I, I use the term infamous. Um, so this is peripheral. A di disturbance here um, causes a peripheral vertigo. Disturbance here causes central vertigo. They're both vertigo and you have to base the diagnosis of peripherals or central on other things. So, okay, neuro exam in a, in a patient with vertigo. First thing, as I mentioned, look for the horners. Just look at the patient. If they have ptosis and a small pupil, they have a horners. You're done. Nystagmus. Now, the, the character, a lot of patients with vertigo, perhaps most patients with vertigo will have nystagmus. And these are jerky eye movements. And the character of the nystagmus is very helpful in determining whether it's a peripheral or central problem. Um, if the nystagmus is multidirectional, 
meaning when the patient looks to the left, it beats left. When they look to the right, it beats right. When they look up, it beats up. Multidirectional, that's almost always central. If it's purely unilateral, meaning they look to the left and it beats to the left, they look to the right, and it either doesn't, there is no nystagmus, so it's still beating to the left on right gaze. Same with up gaze, still beating to the left. So unidirectional, almost always peripheral, multidirectional, almost always central. Visual field testing, as I said, is, is very important. And this is kind of, seems to be kind of a um, <clears throat> lost art or thing that people are confused about. And um, some people um, come at the patient with these fingers moving in from like this. And that is not the way to test visual fields. So the visual field system is a movement detection system. It is not an acuity system. Your central vision is the acuity system. So you want to test the peripheral, the, the, uh, uh, peripheral vision with an acuity task, not a movement task. If you're testing it with a movement task, you're testing it at its strength. So if you want to pick up a subtle deficit, you test it by giving it an acuity task. So that means you have the person or cover up one eye and with being fairly close to the patient, you show them fingers in each quadrant and ask them to count the fingers, an acuity task. Not are the fingers moving, but count the fingers. Facial or extremity uh, pin, uh, pin sensation. Most patients with posterior circulation ischemia, um, or many patients, are not going to tell you that they're numb. So numbness, there's multiple elements to the sensory system, um, and the fibers typically affected in posterior circulation stroke are pain and temperature. So typically the patients don't complain of tingling or paresthesias. They, but they've lost pain and temperature sensation. Um, I had a, um, a patient uh, recently who came in uh, with vertigo and uh, happened to notice that he cut himself shaving that morning and didn't feel it. And that really perplexed him, that he had no, sen no pain sensation. So you have to test for it. And that's either with a safety pin uh, or you can test temperature um, with a tuning fork, which is cold because it's metal on two sides. But in patients who have this deficit will often be shocked that, geez, I couldn't feel it. They'll be completely unaware that they've lost sensation and because they, they, they typically don't have paresthesias. You have to test for it. Dysarthria and or hoarseness I talked about earlier. Appendicular ataxia, which is the finger to nose and heel to shin dysmetria. Uh, so there's three kinds of ataxia, appendicular ataxia, uh, truncal ataxia, which is the next one, which is having the patient sit on the cart in the emergency room and seeing if they can prevent themselves from falling to one side. Somebody has vertigo and truncal ataxia, that's almost always a stroke, as is gait ataxia. Okay, this is my editorial slide. Um, this is a common thing. People say, well, if the, you ask the patient if the dizziness is worse when they move their head. So this, the idea behind this is if the patient says yes, that that means it's benign positional vertigo. Well, I, I'm here to tell you that that ain't the case. You know, if you can imagine the vestibular system, as I said earlier, is there to detect head movement so that send impulses to the brain about how the head is moving so the brain can adjust your balance. If you have a disease of a system designed to detect head movement and you move your head and you feel worse, why does that surprise anyone? You know, it's not a discriminator. Worse with head movement is not a discriminator. And, and I don't like this word very much in clinical medicine because uh, um, never is almost never appropriate, but, it's a, but I would say in this case, don't ever make this, this diagnosis is made all the time in the emergency room, mm 
and it's almost always incorrect. 99% of the time, incorrect. I can tell you from 30 plus years of doing neurology, outpatient neurology as well as inpatient, patients with benign positional vertigo do not come to the emergency room. The typical case is some guy who, you know, goes to bed at night, turns over on his left side and gets a brief episode of spinning. He goes, well, that's weird, goes to sleep. And it happens every night for a month, finally he decides to tell his wife about it. Honey, every time I go to bed, I turn on my left side, it spins for a second. She says, well, you better go see the doctor. So another month passes before he decides to go to see the doctor. So he's had symptoms for two months now. Brief episodes of vertigo related to change in head position. They don't come to the emergency room. I think the confusion comes in is that this diagnosis, benign positional vertigo, gets conflated with all peripheral vestibular problems. So if you look at the list of the possible causes of peripheral vestibulopathy, labyrinthitis, vestibular neuronitis, Meniere's disease, benign positional vertigo is on that list. But it's not synonymous with those other things. It's one cause. People don't come to the emergency room with this for this. Okay, let's talk about imaging. Um, CT is useful only for excluding uh, intracerebral hemorrhage. Very good for picking up hemorrhage. So if somebody has a cerebellar hemorrhage or a brainstem hemorrhage, you will see it on the CT scan for sure. Um, it's not good for ischemic stroke in the brainstem or the cerebellum. Now, if the patient has been symptomatic for a couple of days and has a cerebellar infarct, you might see it on a CT scan. Um, and even MRI, which I know we tend to think <coughs> MRI is the gold standard, but even MRI is not 100% sensitive for brainstem ischemia. It misses significant particularly again acutely. If you repeat the MRI a couple of days later, it picks up many of them. But it's unlike an the anterior to cerebral cortex, the anterior circulation where, where it's very sensitive, it is not as sensitive for the brainstem. CT angiogram is by far the best diagnostic tool for the vascular imaging. It's fast, it's accurate. Um, MRA is if you want to get a full study, you have to get an MRI of the brain, MRA of the head, and an MRA of the neck, the latter requiring gadolinium. So you're talking about three studies to get vascular imaging. So the patient's going to be in the scanner for an hour and a half, as opposed to you can get a, a good technician can do a CT angiogram in, what, eight minutes, something like that. So it's fast and accurate, best test. The other thing about the MRA is it tends to overestimate stenosis. Overestimate stenosis. Okay, this is really important, and this is, um, we're going to spend some time on the HINTS uh, uh, data. And this was published in Stroke in 2009, and I remember at the beginning I showed you that article from the New England Journal from the 1980s, 25% of people over the age of 60 with acute onset of dizziness, a stroke. They had 101 patients with acute onset of vertigo, nausea, and vomiting, and unsteady gait. Um, and they had w one or more risk factors, smoking, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, atrial fib, diabetes, eclampsia, hypercoagulable state, recent cervical trauma, prior stroke, or MI. So, one risk or more risk factors in acute onset of vertigo, nausea, vomiting, and unsteady gait. Only, whoops, only a quarter of these patients had a peripheral vestibular etiology. 76, or a little over 75 percent, had a central etiology. 69 were ischemic stroke patients. Four were hemorrhages. Two had multiple sclerosis, and one had tegretol toxicity. So 69 ischemic strokes out of 101, that's a 
significant percentage. Hunter, sudden onset of vertigo, nausea, vomiting, and steady gait with one risk factor. Look at this. The age range was 26 to 92. 26. So the most common cause of posterior circulation strokes in young people is probably vertebral artery dissection, which are not rare. So just because they're 26 and they're dizzy doesn't mean they can't have a stroke. 12% of the initial MRIs were negative, done 8 to 48 hours after the onset of symptoms. Four were negative more than 24 hours after. You had to have a positive MRI to get diagnosed as a stroke in this particular study. Follow-up MRIs were done 2 to 10 days later, confirming a diagnosis. Severe truncal ataxia was seen only in central lesions. Michael, I'm pretty confident that your friend if they would have chested for truncal ataxia, they would have found it. You know, almost everybody with a cerebellar infarction is going to have truncal ataxia. And I know, you know, we're busy in the ED. We don't have time. We've got to get help to stand up dizzy patients. But it's a lot easier. Just have them sit up on the edge of the, on the, edge of the bed and dangle their feet down. Just see if they can sit there without falling over. You know, patients with labyrinthitis can sit they won't like it, they don't like moving, but if they, they can do it, whereas patients with cerebellar strokes can't. So here's the HINTS exam. So they divided it into what they call a benign exam and a dangerous exam, looking at three things. The uh, head impulse test, the H, little h stands for horizontal head impulse test, Unidirectional nystagmus and absent skew. I'll explain all those things in a second. But I want you to pay attention to the conjunctives. This conjunctive is and. This conjunctive is or. Okay? So to have a benign exam, all three must be true. All three must be true to be a benign exam. Benign meaning it's peripheral, not stroke. Dangerous exam, only one has to be true. So all three have to be true for benign, only one for, for stroke. Da let's look at these numbers. 100% sensitive, 96% specific. I think the only one that they missed was the Tegretol toxicity patient had a, had a dangerous exam. So these, these are big numbers for any clinical, clinical, this is a clinical test that you can do in 30 to 60 seconds at the bedside. Once, I mean, once you get used to doing it, you can do it in 30 to 60 seconds. It's not, it does not take a long time. So what are, what are we talking about here? So the head, horizontal head impulse test, um, so what this means is Patient's sitting on the exam table in front of you, and you're standing there, and you hold the patient's side of their head, put your hands on the side of their head, and you tell them to look at your nose and keep the, your, their eyes fixed on your nose. Then you move their head quickly 20 degrees to, to one side. If they cannot maintain fixation, on your nose, in other words, if when they, you move their head, their eyes go with the head, then that's an abnormal head impulse test. And that means peripheral vestibular problem, not central. So, so it's a little bit counterintuitive. So if the head impulse test is abnormal, that means peripheral. Whereas if they can keep their eyes fixated on your nose, then that implies that's a, a, a uh, implies a central problem. You do it both sides, so 20 degrees one side, 20 degrees the other side. If they can't do it on either side, it's abnormal. The stagmus I talked about before, um, unidirectional typically means vestibular, multidirectional, or vertical nystagmus. In other words, it's beating upward instead of horizontally. It's usually um, central. So 
um, and then skew deviation is an acquired vertical misalignment. So vertical misalignment, no, normally your eyes are aligned like this. So vertical misalignment means that one eye is up or down. It's a vertical misalignment. And it's a meaning it's new. And you can see this um, e easily. First of all, sometimes you can just look at the patient and see that their eyes are off in the vertical plane. Then that, that's skew. But you can sometimes the subtler ones you can pick up by alternately covering each eye. And if when you cover this eye, then have them fixate on you, then you cover the other eye. If there has to be a, a vertical correction, either down or up, for them to fixate, that's, that's abnormal skew. You can also pick it up with eye movements. If they, if they move, moving your, their eyes to one side, they become vertically misaligned. A lot of these patients will have double vision, but not all of them. So of the 101 patients in the series, 17 had skew, 16 of those had a central vestibular etiology um, and the skew predicted central involvement when the hit, uh, horizontal head impulse test suggested peripheral. So remember I said and and or. So if any one of the three gives you a central and you have to have all three to get <coughs> peripheral. I mean this is very, can be done very, you can do the head impulse test and 30 seconds, nystagmus is less, and skew is, you know, you can do the whole thing in a minute or two, once you get used to doing it. So here's the anatomy slides um, I talked about. This is looking at the brain from the base of the brain. So the head is back like this. This is the posterior circulation, the two vertebral arteries, the basilar artery, and the posterior cerebral arteries. Uh, this is the brain stem, the, this is the pons and the medulla, um, the cerebellum behind it. All, these are the structures typically involved in vertebral and basilar ischemic events. The posterior circulation, the posterior cerebral arteries supply the occipital lobes and the medial part of the temporal lobes, which is why you get a peripheral field problem. You can see that the cerebellum actually has um, multiple arteries supplying it. Here's the posterior inferior, uh, here's the anterior inferior cerebellar artery and the superior cerebellar artery. So there's three arteries that can be affected causing a cerebellar stroke. This is a side view. You can see the posterior cerebral arteries better here, supplying the occipital lobes and the temporal lobes. And the th these are the, the thalamic perforators here. The thalamus is supplied by the posterior circulation. And another picture of the side. Vertebral artery, basilar artery, posterior cerebral artery. Here's the occipital lobe, cerebellum. These are the nuclei that we're we talked about that, which I have a better, oh, I thought I had a, I lost my posterior circulation anatomy slide. Oh no, it's coming up. Okay. Um, five posterior circulation. These are the really 99% of all posterior circulation events fall into one of these five. <coughs> the lateral medullary is the most common brainstem stroke, usually due to vertebral artery occlusion. Broad spectrum of symptoms, which we talked about before. This is the slide I was just thinking about. So this, again, here's the medulla, lateral medulla. You can see all these nuclei. Here's the vestibular nuclei, which gives you the vertigo. Here's for, for nuclei for recurrent laryngeal nerve. And this is this, the contralateral pain and temperature. This is the sympathetics for the Horners. Nuclei for the, going to the phrenic nerve are all in the lateral medulla. Here is a MRI of a lateral medullary infarction, and uh, 
sorry to say this was it, this one was actually missed by the radiologist. Here's the this is the the, the actual, actual bottom cut on the MRI scan. Here's the cerebellum, and here's the medulla, and there's the infarction right here. And I would say that you can see it's fairly subtle, and it's right at the bottom of the study. And I think I put this in here to emphasize that. As a rule of thumb, it is always good to talk to the radiologist or, or put on the requisition what you're looking for, what you're clinically suspicious of. Because so many times the radiologist gets their request or the requisition and it says headache or something, something nonspecific. Huh? No neurologic deficit? Yeah. Well, that's very helpful. Yeah. So either be specific when you do it, write the write the order of of what you're looking for, because it, I promise you, if this radiologist would have said, "Hey, I got this guy here. I want to make sure he doesn't have a lateral medullary infarct," well, the radiologist would have looked at the lateral medulla first, and he wouldn't have missed this. So you know, it's subtle, but it's there. And here's another one that's a little bit more obvious on the other side. This one wasn't missed. But you can see it's, you know, as opposed to the anterior big cortex up here, we got these big areas. It's pretty small. But a lot going on in this part of the brain stem. It can be, cause a lot of problems. Cerebellar infarction, typically do the vertebral artery posterior inferior, inferior cerebellar artery, anterior inferior, one, one of those arteries, it can be any one of them. Sudden onset of dizziness, ataxia, nausea, vomiting, headache, very common, or almost every patient with cerebellar infarct has headache. That's why it's an important thing to think about. The other neurologic symptoms are typically absent, um, although they do have, um, they do have a, a truncal and gait ataxia. They may have appendicular ataxia. Basal artery perforators, um, if you remember I showed you, I forgot to point this out. These are the basal artery perforators. So when I say the basal artery perforator syndrome, I mean one of these smaller arteries gets occluded and causes typically a pontine stroke. Um, double vision is common. They don't usually have dizziness um, or any ataxia. They may have facial, unilateral facial or uh, weakness or numbness, and they may have, they may be dysarthric. Basal artery thrombosis. This is, this is the really important one, the uncommon, but this is the one that needs intraarterial thrombectomy. Often, or typically, stepwise progression of posterior circulations that typically evolves over hours or days. So it's step, another step, another step, you know, progressive, stepwise progression over hours to days. Most patients are going to have pupillary findings and ocular motor findings, double vision, crossed or bilateral symptoms are common, and they can present with coma because the Reticular activating system is in the in the uh, pons and, and midbrain, where this causes ischemia too. Then the posterior cerebral artery syndrome. Uh, this is occipital temporal lobe and thalamus. The occipital ischemia produces the homonymous hemianopsia we talked about earlier. Left temporal ischemia causes receptive aphasia, and these patients, because they're often not thought of as being aphasic, because they're talking but they're talking nonsense. So they're, they're sort of initially thought of as being confused. But abrupt onset of confusion can be this diagnosis. The way you pick it up is by testing the visual fields, because almost all of these people will have visual field abnormalities. All right, let's do a couple cases quickly here. These are all real cases. This, this is one of my favorite cases of all time. 50-year-old guy, this guy was a, a chef in Aspen. 
and uh, he's a little kooky, but this is a quote. I actually admitted him, so I, this is, I know this is correct. I woke up and went to the bathroom to brush my teeth. I started choking, but that's normal for me. So this guy was such an aggressive toothbrusher, he would, so every morning, and if he didn't gag himself, brush, didn't feel like he got a good, so he choked, choked himself, and then, but I coughed real hard. After that, the right side of my face and tongue went numb, and then the left side of my body went numb, this cross syndrome. I couldn't stand up, I kept falling to the right, and I was seeing multiple images. Well, this guy is basically the boy for um, the posterior circulation ischemia. So he went to the hospital. His girlfriend actually he was gonna, wasn't gonna, just going to call. He went to the hospital. Um, he got a CT, CTA, CTA showed a vertebral artery dissection, which he got from, and. Um, the emergency room doctor said, well, you know, he doesn't look that bad. We can probably keep him here, you know. And ultimately, um, they decided to transfer him to Swedish, which turned out to be a good thing because 10 hours after the onset of his symptoms, so this is now 11 o'clock at night, he's on the neuro floor at Swedish, he became unresponsive. And, um, he started having frequent episodes of tonic flexion of his upper extremities, up, upper upper extremities and extension of his lower extremities. Um, so uh, I actually went in to see him at this point. This was, this was um, decorticate posturing is what he's doing. Pupils are small and unreactive. Dolls were absent. So this guy had developed a thrombus on his vertebral artery dissection that had extended into his basal artery, and he thrombosed his basal artery, so he became comatose with posturing. So he went to IA around midnight, and um, he actually did did fine and walked out of the hospital, uh, you know, a couple, two or three weeks later. He had a stormy course, but he did fine. As far as I know, he's back to work. 53-year-old male presents to the emergency room with vertigo and posterior headache. There's the headache. CT negative, so what? Diagnosed with benign positional vertigo, don't ever do that. Given a prescription for meclizine and released. Next day, he develops slurred speech. Repeat CT scan showed a right cerebellar infarction. Got admitted following consciousness, CT with bilateral cerebellar infarctions. So this guy um, having, um, a thrombus in his basal artery as well, but wasn't picked up on. 20-year-old 20 male with diabetes presents the emergency room with awakening with headache, his headache again, dizziness, nausea, vomiting, ataxia, treated with IV fluids and released. All the 20-year-olds can have a stroke, even if they're diabetic. Um, symptoms persisted. Two days developed slurred speech and right upper extremity weakness, found to have a right cerebellar infarction. Um, again, headache, ataxia without vertigo. Um, that's right, he did not have vertigo. He had only, a, his dizziness was ataxia, dysarthria and appendicular ataxia. That's it. I guess, I guess that's it. Do you want to do the other, your other case? This is a case from here. We actually had a case um, at Rose that got TPA uh, a couple months ago. So this was an 81-year-old gentleman with a history of atrial fibrillation, pacer, and hypertension. 
sudden onset of ataxia while walking. I believe he was in the park walking his dog, and then very suddenly was unable to stand up. Did describe it as vertigo and nausea vomiting. 15 minutes prior to arrival, so they called EMS. This alert was called in the field. Um, brought him in right away. The neurologist saw the patient via telemedicine within three minutes. The CT, the head and neck, of course, was a negative hemorrhage, nothing significant in the arteries either. Back to Dr. Jensen's point, his NIH was zero. He had no trouble with the finger to nose and heel to shin. Um, but a key thing that stuck out to me when I was reading this patient's chart was requires a assist to stand. And this is somebody who, again, was walking his dog without a problem. Um, and again, normal heel to shin, finger to nose. He was on warfarin for his atrial fibrillation, but his IR was only 1.6. So he was subtherapeutic. We treated this guy with TP, TPA. Um, he was below the, the range, you know, with the NOACs, the Xeraltos, and the you know, Eliquises, we, we will probably not treat, but remember, Coumadin's a little different. We can give Coumadin with an INR, you know, or 1.6, no problem. Um, but that's, those are the kind of main points that I wanted to bring up with this case. NIH is zero. Don't, that's not an automatic reason not to treat somebody. So he yeah. did really well. I believe he did go to rehab to scalding for a couple of weeks, and, but most of his symptoms resolved uh, before he even left the hospital. He did great. Couldn't get an MRI because of his pacer, but clinically. So this is an illustration of a um, couple of things, but um, you know, what I said earlier about this probably was a cerebellar infarction. Um, and, you know, in an old person of this age to um, have a completed infarct or a significant infarct is going to be a significant long term morbidity. The other thing is that um, his, INR, his NIH was zero. And I could tell you that a lot of places um, in the U.S would not have treated this guy because of the, the NH of zero. Um, so, and uh, if you read the, um, you know, the literature, um, the, the, you can make a case that a person like this, that you can defend yourself that a person like this doesn't have to be treated. But I think the, the field is moving um, away from that sort of posture, more toward treating the patient based on their clinical symptoms and, um, you know, is this, is this going to be a potentially disabled, in other words, instead of looking solely at the NIH stroke scale, is this going to be a potentially disabling problem for this patient? And then treating them on that basis, which I think is really a better way to do it. I mean, take the in patient individually and, you know, uh, and, you know, the, the risk, in, in a, particularly in a case like this where 15 minutes from onset, I mean, the chances of getting a symptomatic hemorrhage in a patient like this is really, really low. So the risk of treatment is low. The benefit is potentially quite significant. So, you know, I would certainly want to be treated if this was me. Um, but it's an illustration of just make the point that not everybody in the, in the, in the country would treat somebody like this. Michael? So, yeah, the Dix Hall Pike maneuver is um, there's two maneuvers for benign positional vertigo. The uh, Dix Hall Pike maneuver is the diagnostic test, and the Epley maneuver is the treatment test. The Dix Hall Pike is um, where you try to reproduce the um, vertigo by pacing, pacing, placing the patient in the offending position. Um, uh, typically, um, if they say whenever I turn over to the left, um, I put, I get the symptoms. So you have them sit on the edge of the bed, turn their head to the left, lean them all the way back, and see if you can reproduce the vertigo. And typically, you see some ro rotatory nystagmus. Um, but it's just, they're not symptomatic. You tilt them back, and then they get 
a few seconds of vertigo associated with this nystagmus. That's the Dix Hall Pike. The, um, I didn't talk about it because I didn't want to talk because I don't think these aren't benign positional vertigo. These are patients who don't just have seconds of symptoms. The epile is the is the treatment where you try to get these calcium oxalate crystals up over the top of the semicircular canal um, and try to make them better. Any other questions? I have one. Yes. <clears throat> If which now? If you get a patient who's had a posterior circulatory stroke, yeah, they recover. Uh huh. What do you do with them? Well, I mean, it would be like any other stroke in terms of secondary stroke prevention. So you try to determine the mechanism of the stroke, <coughs> and um, knowing that they're at risk for further strokes, statistically at risk for further strokes. So if you know the mechanism or why it happened, then you can best. Um, stroke is, you know, totally different than, say, for example, coronary artery disease, 99% of which is due to atherosclerosis of the coronary arteries. Well, that's not true with stroke. I mean, and stroke can be caused by, has, the, the causes of stroke is, are many, many more than coronary artery disease. And you can have stroke at any, you can have stroke in utero. You can have stroke as a, as a neonate as a child, um, adolescent, 20s, 30s, you know. Uh, and of course, the cause will change with age, but um, by determining, so the answer to your question is, what do you do with them? You, you work on secondary stroke prevention. Why did, why did this happen? And then based on that mechanism, what is our best method or methods to reduce their risk of having another stroke? Yeah, so your typical 28-year-old with a posterior circulation stroke, I mean, let's say it's for tubal artery dissection, then um, most of those heal, and they're going to be either anticoagulated or antiplatelet agents for a period of weeks, and then repeat the imaging. If it's healed, then take them off the, the stuff. So they, you know, if it's... Um, and do we treat them like they're okie-dokie after that? I mean, it, it, I'm an anesthesiologist. So they don't need anything else after that. Yeah, the risk of recurrent dissection is very, very low. So once the dissection heals, they don't need any further treatment. It's not like a 75-year-old with diabetes and hypertension, hyperlipidemia, you know, where they have to keep going on their aspirin, uh, statin, blood pressure control, blah, blah, blah. It's not like that. Once, if it's a dissection and it heals, they can go about their lives without anything else. Yeah. Topic, like PFOs of the heart, is that mostly anterior circulation, or do you still do that work? So, the statistic, you know, yes, usually. That, if you think about it, um, it's about 75% of the uh, cerebral circulation goes through the anterior carotids, and 25% through the, the posterior circulation. So, 12.5% for each vertebral, 37.5% roughly for each carotid. So just on a three to one basis, you'd expect proximal emboli to go three quarters of the time anyway to, to the anterior circulation, usually. Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you all for your attention. Thank you. Thank you.